Now we're going to put to work the main equation of quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation, and use it to solve a very interesting problem that will also illustrate why quantum mechanical effects are not important in our everyday life, while being essential when we're dealing with atomic length scales. The question that we're going to ask is what happens if we enforce a particle-like uh, solution in our quantum mechanical problem? So basically what it means is that we postulate, let's postulate that at t equals zero, at an initial moment of time t equals zero, we have the wave function uh, such as this, which is called Gaussian wave packet. And uh, this wave function uh, it basically describes a particle which is localized in space around zero. So it's a typical Gaussian around zero. And the spread out of this Gaussian is of order d, which is the parameter of the model. So a here is some coefficient. It's not very important at this stage. Now, the calculation that we are going to present is uh, essentially the evolution of this initial condition with time under the action of the Schrodinger equation. And it's a bit technical question. So for those of you who are not interested in technical details, I would like just to present the final answer so that you can understand the bottom line without going into technicalities. And so the final answer is uh, here. So here we have the wave function as a function of time, modulus of its squared, so which describes essentially the density of particles. And as we will see, this um, uh, psi squared it has the same Gaussian form as the original uh, wave function. But the difference here is that the parameter d, which describes its spreading, it, it increases with time. And it increases with time as 1 plus t squared over some tau squared, where tau squared is this uh, uh, typical uh, time scale at which the spreading occurs. So if we now look at uh, this dependence of psi squared uh, on x, as time goes by, we will see a more and more uniform density. So eventually it will be almost flat. Now, this basically implies that a particle-like solution, this type of wave packet, is unstable in quantum mechanics. So, uh, but the important thing is uh, the time scale itself at which this spreading occurs. And um, uh, let us estimate this time scale for two uh, sort of diametrically opposite cases. So one case will be the case of an electron, a microscopic elementary particle with a mass about 10 to minus uh, 27 grams. And let's assume that it's localized uh, on atomic length scales of order one angstrom, 10 to minus eight centimeters. So if we plug in the numbers, what we're gonna see is the typical time scale at which the spreading, the localization radius, if you want, of this electron doubles is uh, of the order of 10 minus 16 um, uh, seconds, which is a, an extremely short time scale, uh, hardly observable in any experiment. Now, if we take on the country a macroscopic object, let's say a typical human being, which is also described uh, by laws of quantum mechanics, uh, so the difference will be quite uh, noticeable. So here, well, the mass, of course, of a macroscopic object here will be around, let's say, 50 kilograms, and let's say we want to be localized on a distance of order one centimeter. Now, if we now plug in the numbers into this equation, what we're gonna see is that uh, the typical uh, time scale at which sort of quantum delocalization of a human being occurs is a quarter 10 to, to, 30, to plus 30 seconds. So to put this number in perspective, so this is equal to 10 to the 23 years, or 10 to the 13, 10 trillion lifetimes of the universe. So basically it's a, in some sense, meaningless number. So it's a number which, never, which is never relevant in, in any realistic uh, circumstances. So we shouldn't be worrying too much about being quantum uh, delocalized due to quantum mechanical effects. And if you now look at different uh, uh, time scales for various objects that we're dealing in, in our everyday lives, we're going to see that essentially for all these objects, even the smallest ones, we uh, can safely say that quantum mechanical effects are completely irrelevant. But the moment we're, go we're going to go to uh, fundamental uh, microscopic lens scales is going to change very significantly. Now I'm going to actually derive the main result that I presented in the previous slide, the time evolution of the uh, Gaussian wave packet. And as I mentioned to you, this derivation is a bit on the technical side. So uh, those of you who are not really interested in these technicalities may just skip it towards the end of the lecture. But uh, those who want to actually learn uh, the, the technical part of quantum mechanics, which is the main part of quantum mechanics, should pay attention and perhaps re-derive it uh, on your own. 
Now, the main element of the solution is the decomposition of the original, of the initial condition of this wave packet into the plane waves. So, plane waves are presented here. So, sort of as a motivation as to why we want to do something like this, we should re recall that the uh, Schrodinger equation was uh, deduced or derived almost by construction to describe waves rather than particles. So, in the initial condition that we have chosen is in some sense an arbitrary function. So there's absolutely no reason why it would be a convenient solution to, to anything. So while the plane waves are indeed the solutions, and uh, so by decomposing uh, this uh, function or any initial condition for this matter into these plane waves, we actually simplify things a lot, as we will see uh, later. From the mathematical point of view, this decomposition is nothing but the Fourier transform of this Gaussian wave function into the, uh, into the harmonic functions, into this uh, cosines and sines. And we know very well how to uh, do this uh, decomposition, but before we, uh, before we go to it, so I would like to remind you the following uh, identity for a uh, Gaussian integral, which, we, which actually we're going to use at least three times in this derivation, in different contexts. So if we have uh, an exponential of a quadratic function with some coefficients alpha and beta here, so the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity is well known, and it's given by this equation. So we're going to just use it later on. Now, uh, the reason it's relevant at this, uh, this stage of the derivation is because the uh, Fourier transform, or in other words, this, this uh, Fourier harmonics, which in the context of quantum mechanics are called wave function in the momentum space, are determined exactly by this type of a Gaussian integral. Because what we have to do in order to determine this phi of p, we have to take, uh, evaluate the integral of this, uh, of this exponential e to the power minus x squared or 2d squared, with, uh, with this uh, e to the power minus i or h bar px. And uh, if we uh, look at this integral so and compare it with this uh, Gaussian uh, expression, we will, we will see that alpha here is, is equal to 1 over 2 uh, d squared and beta is equal to minus i h bar p. So uh, if we uh, use now this formula, so beta squared is equal to minus p squared over h squared and uh, divided by uh, 4 alpha will give us uh, the following expression. So I completely ignore the overall coefficient, it's not really important for the following. So now um, let me just erase this uh, and get rid of this Gaussian integral. So uh, uh, now uh, we're going to interpret actually this Fourier transform in an interesting way. So uh, the reason we have uh, constructed this initial condition in this form was uh, because uh, we wanted to localize our particle sort of on a certain length scales of order d. So the uncertainty of our initial condition in, in, in the real space is of order d. But by looking at this sort of wave function in the momentum space, we see that the uncertainty in momentum uh, delta p is of order h bar over d. So it's inverse proportional to the localization distance in real space. And so this uh, sort of uh, dual relation, so the more it's localized in real space, the less is localized in momentum space, is vice versa, is a particular manifestation of what is known as a general Heisenberg uncertainty uh, principle, which is, uh, uh, which is written here. So that in, uh, in general, whatever wave function you have, whatever quantum state you possibly can construct, there is always a constraint that uh, the uncertainty in position times the uncertainty in uh, momentum is uh, uh, larger or uh, equal than uh, h-bar, h-bar being the Planck constant. So now we're in the position to uh, solve the main uh, technical problem that we formulated in the beginning of uh, this uh, segment, that is uh, to solve the Schrodinger equation, uh, the free Schrodinger equation here, so Hamiltonian here is just p squared over 2m, with the initial condition written as so. So instead of writing it as a Gaussian in real space, we write it as a linear combination of plane waves. That was basically the Fourier transform in the previous slide. Now, in order to write the time-dependent uh, wave function, uh, we need to take into account two uh, simple circumstances. The first uh, circumstance is the fact that the Schrodinger equation, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, is a linear equation which implies that if uh, we have several solutions to this equation, psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, etc., uh, their sum is also a solution, with the initial condition being simply the sum of the uh, corresponding initial conditions. Now, the second circumstance is uh, we have to recall that a plane wave, 
are written as so is, is indeed the solution to the Schrodinger equation. In some sense, we have constructed Schrodinger equation such that it would give us this guy as a solution. And here the epsilon of p is the energy of the electron, the energy of the free electron, and simply equal to p squared over 2m. Now, uh, if we take a look at the initial condition again written in this form, we see that it's an integral over momentum. But the integral uh, is a sum in some sense, it just happens to be an infinite sum. So we can uh, use the fact that uh, the Schrodinger equation is a linear equation and uh, write uh, psi of x and t, the full solution, uh, as so. So basically all we have to do is to replace uh, this um, plane wave at, at t equals zero uh, with the plane wave at uh, a finite time uh, with uh, epsilon of p being p squared over 2m. And so to write now the wave function in a more convenient way, uh, so what remains now is to calculate the Gaussian integral over momentum. And it can be done again using uh, the same uh, uh, identity that uh, we used in the previous slide, but now the parameter alpha here is going to be d squared over 2h squared uh, plus i uh, t divided by 2m h bar, and the parameter beta now is i x uh, over h bar. So again, if we use the same identity, what we get is uh, the, uh, the following expression for the wave function. We see that this expression is an uh, 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 intri intrinsically complex function, but if we're interested just in determining the density uh, of our particle, so where the particle is located, so the only thing which matters, as I mentioned already, and we'll discuss it in more details a little later, is the absolute value of the wave function squared. So uh, this absolute value squared can be calculated again. We don't we don't worry too much about the overall coefficients. We only look at what is uh, what appears in the exponential. So we can write this uh, uh, we can write this uh, density as uh, an exponential, basically from here minus x squared over t squared. But there is also another term which is one uh, over one plus t squared over tau squared. And tau here is exactly the time scale we discussed in the beginning, which is mass times the localization length in some sense, d squared divided by h bar. So uh, this completes the derivation of the main result that we discussed earlier, and also it completes uh, the first lecture. Thank you very much, and I will see you in class uh, later in the week.